Welcome, pool guys and gals, to the Let's Talk About Pools podcast, where your host, Lauren Broom, will take a splash into many topics in the pool industry to educate all aquatic professionals. Listen in, and you just might be surprised what you'll learn. So let's jump right in. Welcome, everybody, to the Let's Talk About Pools podcast today. And on episode 25, my guest is Eric Lupton with Lifesaver Pool Fence. And we're going to talk about pool fencing as a layer of protection for drowning prevention. So please join me on this awesome episode today, and I hope you enjoy it. I want to say thank you today to my main podcast sponsor, which is Skimmer. Um, Go check them out. They have so much to offer the pool industry when it comes to pool route management and so much more. And they're awesome, awesome people in the industry. So check them out and listen to their ad coming up and then the podcast episode afterwards. Thank you for your support. This is Skimmer, software for the modern pool professional. What can you do with Skimmer? See all your customers on a map, build service routes quickly, and let Skimmer optimize them for you. Access customer information, including contact details and full service history anytime and anywhere. Customize work orders to track jobs like repairs and filter cleanings. Email your customers when you complete a service. You can include service details and on-site photos. Does your customer need a part? Add it to the shopping list and track it from purchase to installation. Skimmer will even remind you what parts you need for the day, and you can mark them as installed right when you're finished. Skimmer doesn't just store your service history. It helps you get paid. We integrate with QuickBooks Online for fast, easy invoicing. And we've got more billing options coming soon. All that's just the beginning. Go to GetSkimmer.com to watch our demo video, check out our online tutorials, and see if Skimmer is right for you. Welcome, everybody, today to the Let's Talk About Pools podcast. And my guest on today is Eric Lupton. He's the president of Lifesaver Pool Fence Systems. Welcome today, Eric. How are you? Fantastic. How are you doing? Awesome. I've been really excited to have you on. I know a lot of people know your name, know who you are when it comes to pool fencing. You guys have been involved for a very long time in this industry, and that's uh, we're doing. A, I'm doing a drowning prevention series, getting into layers of protection, and definitely wanted to have you on with your background here. It's awesome. Well, thanks, and it's great that you're taking the time to do a, a series on drowning prevention. I know a lot of times the, the pool industry kind of wants to shy away from it or not talk about it. Uh, you know, we've always kind of been the the stepchild. You know, no one wants to you know pay attention to us. And so it's, it's great that you're, you know, shining a spotlight on something that's so important that, you know, I know a lot of pool builders would rather not bring up um, and a lot of service guys want to talk about. It. So it's great that you're, that you're doing it. Yes. Very excited about it. I, I've got a lot of episodes this summer into the early fall that will be on different topics. Um, but we have to try to put it all together and mesh it together to do what's called layers of protection. Right. So let's get into a little bit about you. Tell, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your company and your background. Yeah, so you know, Lifesaver was founded in 1987 by my, my parents. Uh, it started off in their garage. They, the, the garage was just big enough where they could fit a pool fence table and make the fencing. You know, my mom would sew the mesh all night, uh, which was you know crazy because she had two little kids. I was, you know... I was probably six and my brother was two or three. And so, you know, she would sew the mesh all night. And then my dad would get up at three o'clock in the morning. He had a paper route and whatever money he made from his paper route was his advertising budget. And then when the sun rose, you know, me and my brother would wake up, she'd get us ready for school or I'd go off to school. She'd take care of him. And, you know, she would run the office while he would go out and sell a job. And if he got it, he'd come back, make the fence in the garage and go back out and install it. And they did that for a while until they, you know, were big enough to get a little warehouse and a, a bigger warehouse. And you know, that went on for, for a long time. Eventually, they got a couple of dealers where they sold wholesale to. Wow. Know, first one was in California. And, uh, and yeah, so they grew from there. And in 2002, my dad retired. Um, and I'd already been here for several years. And I, I kind of took it over full time. And, uh, yeah, we've been growing ever since. So, you know, since I started... Then, you know, we've grown, you know, 10 times in, in revenue from where I started. And you know, we've now got 90 dealers throughout the U.S. And we're in five, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, five continents and 15 countries. Ooh, and, wow. Yeah, we've got a 13,000 square foot facility here and um, another shipping center in, 
California, in Los Angeles for those folks, and about 30 people here locally. And you know, roughly, I'd say, you know, between 100 to 150 people you know, put on a, a lifesaver shirt every day when they go to work. And uh, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Awesome. Awesome. And and you've been involved in with the National Drowning Prevention Alliance and that kind of thing. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, water safety has always been, you know, important to us and important to the company. And I think a lot of the other pool fence companies think of themselves as either a pool company or a fence company. But we've always thought of ourselves as a child safety company or a water safety company. So my uh, my dad actually coined the term layers of protection back in 1988 at a meeting with the Broward County Health Department. And then he wrote it into a book in 1989 uh, where he put it in writing for the first time. So, so yeah, water safety has always been you know a critical part of our DNA. And yeah, several years back, I was elected uh, unanimously to the board of the, the Natural Drowning Prevention Alliance. And you know, the following year, they elected me to be the vice president. So I did that for one term. Um, and yeah, it was a great experience. They they do great work, and um, I am hoping to eventually make it out to one of their their conferences again once things uh, get a little settle more settle down. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, but yeah, they do great stuff, and um, you know, I think they're they're a great part of the community. Yeah, yeah, I just. Uh, been involved a little bit with them fairly recently as well. So corresponding with them and getting information, the very wealth of information. If you need any info on drowning prevention, everybody should go Google National Drowning Prevention Alliance. And yeah, I, was, EPA. I was really proud of my, my work there. Um, I think the, the, the longest lasting thing that uh, my, my time there will be is I I redesigned that the logo. Uh, they had the same logo forever. And we uh, one of the first things I did was you know, help them uh, update their logo. So whenever I go to the website, I'm excited to see they're still still rocking it. So it's yeah, that's my mark. That literally my mark on the NDPA. You know. Awesome. So we talked mentioned layers of protection. Your dad coined the phrase back in the 1980s. How does pool fencing fit into layers of protection? Well, I always say that there's you know five and a half layers of protection. Uh, the first one is obviously parent supervision. Uh, but the problem is that parent supervision can and does fail. You know, 69% of all fatal drowning cases of kids under five years old, it was one or both parents were responsible for supervising. But, you know, no parent is perfect, right? You don't know if, you know, the older child is going to run in with a bloody nose. You have to sleep at some point. You have to use the restroom. And one study showed that in 77% of fatal drowning cases, the child was seen less than five minutes before seeing before being found in the pool. And in a lot of those cases, they were last seen in their room sleeping. So the idea that you're going to go check on your on your son or daughter and then come back less than five minutes later uh, in the middle of the night, you know, that could happen to anybody. Um, so parent supervision can't be the only layer of protection. So the next one we do after that is high locks on all the doors and windows. Um, that's super important. And then after high locks on all the doors and windows, you get to pool fencing. And I consider a pool fence to be a removable mesh pool safety fencing that's specifically designed to keep children away from the pool. So that's not a wrought iron fence. That's not an ornamental fence. That's not a, an aluminum fence. That's a fence who's been designed specifically for child safety. So the mesh fence doesn't have any handholds or footholds. So you can climb over it. It has a self-closing, self-latching gate with a child-resistant latch that's hard for a kid to get to. That latch is key lockable. Um, it surrounds the pool specifically. It doesn't um, go just around the, the yard. It separates the pool and isolates it from the backyard. So it's not just protecting your neighbors, it's protecting your, your kids as well because your perimeter fence is only keeping your, your neighbor kids safe. Um, you know, a pool fence, you know, separates the pool from the rest of the backyard. So, so yeah, a pool fence is, you know. I'm glad that you differentiated the difference for the Yeah, it's important, like, right? They're thinking, oh, but the back, they have a fence around their backyard. And I was right. thinking the same thing, but your kids can leave that back screen door or whatever and get to the pool without having to go through that fence. Yeah. I mean, if they're in your house, then they're inside the, you know, inside the barrier of that fence. Right. So you need a fence that isolates your pool for the rest of your backyard. And also if you're in your backyard, if you're grilling, if you're using the swing set, if you're you know playing in the grass, you want to make sure that you have a pool fence is stopping your child from accessing the pool while you're in your backyard. And that's why it's super important. Um, so the next layer after the pool fencing is alarms on in the pool. Um, I prefer one that the child wears, like a safety turtle. 
because they have ones that float in the pool. They're not super reliable. They've got they've got issues. But pool arms are a great additional layer of protection. And then after that, uh, swim instruction, uh, training your, your child to to save herself. Um, you know, ISR is the, the you know the big brand that people know about. You know, rolling over and floating. Um, there's other lesson systems where they teach the kid to you know kick back and grab the edge. But you know, survival swim, which is different from traditional swim lessons, where the focus of the lesson is teaching the child to save herself if she falls in the pool, is is super important. And then the the half a one, I call it the the 5.5, because it's not really a layer of protection. It's kind of an after the fact. Is knowing CPR. Um, so if everything else fails, if the supervision fails, if the high locks and doors on the doors and windows get left open, if you took the pool fence down, if the alarm didn't go off, if the child panicked and the the swim survival training didn't kick in, then you know your last chance is knowing CPR. Um, and everybody who has kids should know CPR. So, exactly. so yeah, those are what I consider to be the, the five and a half layers of protection. And, and pool fencing is the only one of those that's providing a physical barrier that's keeping the child out of the pool. Um, you know, all the rest, you know, the kid's already wet, you know, the alarm, the alarm, the swim instruction. Um, so in parents revision, obviously there's no, no physical barrier, but you know, I think the pool fence is important because it's the thing that's actually stopping kids from accessing the pool. Exactly. And, and, Let's talk about your specific pool fencing. So, you know, Lifesaver pool fence, like I said, it's a, it's a mesh pool safety fencing. It's installed in sections and the, the mesh is, is heavy duty stuff. It lasts forever. It has a lifetime warranty. Uh, the poles are extruded aluminum with a, with a solid base. They can withstand, you know, up to 105 pounds at, at three feet high. That's more than triple the Florida building code recommendation. Uh, it has a self let self-closing, self-latching gate, and that's all welded together using inch and a quarter square stock aluminum. You know, it looks flimsy because it's mesh, but it's actually really quite strong. You know, we've got cool videos of people throwing bowling balls at it and you know, running at it and bouncing off of it. Uh, we did a great um, collaboration with the uh, UFC heavyweight champion, Stipe Miocic, and you know, we did a fence around his yard, and he uh, took video of him like punching and kicking it and like grabbing it and shaking the heck out of it. And, um, and then he comments afterward that, you know, he was, he was surprised how strong it was. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's tougher than it looks. Um, I think like a lot of us are, so it's a, uh, it's a good thing. And we've been doing it for over 30 years. We've kind of got it down to a science and we've been making it better and better over the years. And every year we come out with you know something to improve it a little bit more. So, so yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's got a lifetime warranty and, you know, it's installed by core drilling, um, using a water-cooled diamond cord drilling machine rig, we drill an inch and eighth hole every three feet, and then a sleeve goes in the hole, and the pole goes to that sleeve. So, yeah, we drill into your deck to make sure it's really secure, and, and that's how we put it in. I was going to ask, and is it, can the parent, like, take it out? Is it easy for them to remove, like, when they're actually out at the pool and use the pool and they don't want, like, the barrier around the entire thing while they're having, like, a party or something? Right. So if you're just using your pool on a regular day, you can just open the gate, walk through, go in, and it's fine, right? But, yeah, say you're having an adult-only party and you want the pool fence down, you know, maybe 10 minutes it takes to take the whole thing down. You know, not a big deal. Um, moms can do it, no problem. You know, just as simple as unhooking the latch. And then once you unhook it, the tension's released and you can roll it up really easy. Nice. So, so yeah, pretty lightweight. Simple. Yeah, pretty simple lightweight. to take up and down. Yeah. Awesome. So that that makes people even more willing to, if they didn't realize how easy it was and how light it was, because some people might think, oh, it's going to be a pain in the neck to move right. if I want to have a party or something. Please, please, listeners, don't let that be the reason why you don't put a safety fence around your pool, because you just said how easy it is. And it could save a life if you have a child living in your household that could get into that pool. It just takes one time. Yeah. Um, the child living in your house or the neighbor's house. You know, there's a stat that says that 90 percent of autistic children who, who wander off, who leave the house, who die, 90 percent of them drown, uh, which sounds crazy. Uh, the nine out of 10 children who, you know, get outside their house, uh, mm -hmm. who die are going to die in a, in a body of water. Um, so, you know, and that could be your pool. You know, if you don't have it fenced off properly, um, you don't know what kind of neighbor's kid could make their way over. It happens all the time. 
So, so just because you don't have kids doesn't mean you don't want to protect the uh, very dangerous body of water that you have in your backyard. Exactly. And that fits in really well because I just uh, interviewed uh, Stacy Hoagland with uh, Autism Society of Florida. Yeah. We talked about special needs children and water safety specifically for that, that group. Yeah, it's so super. they're very attracted to water because of having some type of autism spectrum disorder. Mm-hmm. They just have a, an affinity for water. It looks awesome to them. And going underwater for some, it bothers them and some it, it doesn't, they, it actually, you know, all the sounds and everything are gone. So if they know that that's the experience, it attracts them even more. So that fits in very well with the safety message I've been trying to bring with the podcast there. Hey, everybody. I just want to stop with a short intermission to introduce our other podcast sponsor today, poolmarketing.com. Thank you, Mary Ann and Joe Trusty. If you need anything from them, they've got so many different ways that they can help a pool service company, a pool builder, anybody out there. They've got an awesome magazine now that's out in publication and for the pool industry. And they're just a great supporter of everybody in the industry and getting information out there and just helping all of us. So contact them and listen into their ad and see how they can help you at poolmarketing.com. And thank you for being a podcast sponsor as always, a continuing sponsor. You may be wondering, why do my competitors always show up ahead of me on Google? You want to know how you can get your website to the top of the search engines fast? You've been racking your brain thinking of who can help you with your website search rank. Well, wonder no more. Poolmarketing.com specializes in SEO for pool companies and can get you to the top of the search engines in no time. So I have other, you know, lots of different people that listen on the podcast. So specifically, what should pool service technicians know about pool fencing? Yeah. So, you know, I know a lot of pool guys find the pool fence to be a hindrance, right? You're trying to get in the backyard. You want to get in and do your thing, get out. You've got this this mesh barrier. It's literally a barrier between you and and the pool you're trying to clean. Um, But it's really important that it's treated like the safety um, device that it is. So for instance, I was telling you before we started, you know, I have a, I have a pool service company. I have a pool fence around my pool, of course. And almost every week they get, they leave it open. And almost every week I call them and, you know, complain because, you know, if I had kids or if a neighbor's kid came into my backyard and the fence was left open by the pool service guy, um, that could end really tragically. In fact, I know a story of a family whose child drowned because their pool service technician left open the pool fence. And obviously, you know, that, that tech has to live with that. Um, I think there was some, um, there was some legal uh, recourse that was taken. I think there was a lawsuit involved. Um, I think they lost the, the pool service company and the technician in particular. Uh, there might be legal ramifications beyond that, you know, some kind of negligence. So it's really important that if you open the fence to get into the pool, if you take part of it down to clean the pool, then you got to put it back. You have to really take it seriously that this, you know, could really affect someone's life, could literally end someone's life if it's not treated with the the importance it deserves. So yeah, if you service pools, you know, make sure you close it up, seal it up, latch it all back like it was. And if you're not sure, if you're if you get stuck, you know, call us. We'll be happy to walk you through. You know, if you, if you have a fence that's not going back together for some reason, it should be pretty simple. But you know, if you get hung up, you know, call the, the maker of the fence, call us, and we'll be happy to make sure that you you get it back correctly. And, and big thing too, is make sure the pool service technician communicates anything that's not working properly to the homeowner. Yeah, absolutely. The, the homeowner is aware of it as well. Cause a lot of times they walk in, they're there in the morning, homeowners at work or whatever, and they don't want to go through the whole process of calling them, texting them or emailing them. Right. But if the homeowner is aware of it, then maybe they'll do be extra aware while they're waiting for that to be repaired if they have children in the house. Sure, absolutely. You know, maybe have one of their other layers of protection on high alert because the, say the gate isn't latching properly to the pool fence and it has to be fixed, you know? 
some anything like that. Always communicate. Communication is always like a big breakdown that causes a lot of problems. So I think that what you said and communicating, I think would be the two biggest things right there for a pool service tech to do. Don't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. If there's something obviously wrong with the fence or any of the other layers of protection, you know, it's great to notify the homeowner. Awesome. So I know that you're involved in a lot of the legal type or are aware of what's going on, you know, in the legal end of things with uh, rules and stuff. So let's talk about the current uh, affair with Florida safety laws when it comes to barriers. Yeah. yeah. When Debbie Wasserman Schultz got the original pool safety law passed, residential pool safety law in uh, 2001, I believe it was a great law. It, mandated that all new pool construction uh, had to have a fence, a four-sided fence around the pool. It had to be an isolation fence. It had to have a self-closing, self-latching gate. And and it was, you know, it had to be up to code. It had to be all kinds of certain standards. And it was one of the best pool safety laws in the country. It was really instrumental in getting a lot of other states to pass pool safety legislation. Uh, since that law was passed, you know, more than 20 years ago now, over time, it's been you know, chipped away at and watered down by, you know, various industries who, you know, find it problematic or found it to be difficult for them. So, you know, first they took away the need for a gate. So the self-latching gate recommendation was, uh, was discarded. So you just had to have a pool fence. Uh, and then eventually they said that instead of a pool fence, you could have hardwired alarms on all your doors and windows. Um, and so instead of a pool fence, you get these alarms, but they had to be a specific kind of alarm. They had to be you know, installed properly, you couldn't turn them off. So that was next. And then eventually they said, well, you get those alarms, but also instead, if you want to go get the, the $10 alarms from Home Depot that are battery operated that you can yank off as soon as the inspector leaves, you, know, you can do that as well. Uh, so then that became an option. And then a couple of years ago, they um, mandated that floating pool alarms, the, the ones that get affected by wind and rain, the ones you can take out with no problem, they're not connected to anything. They said that those are an acceptable layer of protection to meet the law. Hmm. And, and the thing is, you know, the argument the whole time when they had the other alarms was that it was still prevention, right? That we were still preventing access to the pool. But with these alarms, you know, that alarm's not going off until the kid is actually drowning, you know, until the child is in the pool, submerged, and then eventually that alarm goes off. Um, that, that's, you know, you're not going to get any warning until there's an active drowning happening. So um, the, the law right now is, is awful. And, you know, while we've gone backwards, the rest of the country has gone forward. You know, nationally, there seems to be some kind of push for a federal law. California has, in my opinion, the best law in the country right now. They have a list of seven different layers of protection, and you have to pick two of them. So awesome. they follow, Yeah, so they follow the multiple layer of protection uh, recommendations, and that's what they, um, they mandate. So, you know, I think it's really important that – the law at least go back to what it was where you know you had to have either a fence or a hardwired alarm um the way it stands right now it's it's really bad and i think it's only a matter of time before we have a child drown uh, in a pool that is following all the rules and i think that's going to be really terrible well and hopefully florida will get back uh to where they need to be and yeah i think we should follow california yeah. yeah yeah i legislation is a big deal um, I'll have one podcast episode that will be on legislation when it comes to uh, childhood prevention, different than what you've spoken about. Uh, Dr. Bill Kent, uh, trying to encourage uh, in some way notification or requirement of swim lessons of children like entering kindergarten. Gotcha. And I think that instead of requiring the swim lessons, it's notification from the school district to parents of children entering kindergarten. They're, got, they're gonna be handing out like pamphlets on childhood drowning prevention, and then local places that parents can take their kids to for swim lessons. And I think that it got combined into an education bill. But and that's at, great, you know, the only, the only downside of those laws is that the majority of children who drown, drown before their fifth birthday. Mm -hmm. Right, drowning is the number one cause of accidental deaths for kids between one and four years old. So, if you're not getting them trained until kindergarten, most of the kids who are going to die already died. They already drowned. Um, so, I think it might be just a little too late. 
I wish we could do something where it's through more like it, a lot of kids are in childcare. Right. So you go through that whole, you know, Department of Children and Families or whatever the version is in each state that monitors and does inspections of child care centers. And that'd be something that's handed out there. I agree with you. Then you're hitting the population more that you see the drownings in. Right. So, yeah, I mean, there was um, a, a great win recently um, after uh, Bodie, Bodie Miller's um, child drown and Nicole Hughes, they pushed because the previous recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics was that lessons be um, stalled until five years old, that ch children wait until five before they start swim instruction. And, you know, they pushed really hard and they actually got that changed. And now the AAP recommendation is one years old or one year old. Um, and, you know, they have some language in there about, you know, there's not a lot of evidence about the efficacy, but uh, but still, you know, they made that recommendation change and, you know, we we're really glad to see it. It was a long time coming and I know they worked really hard for it. So, so finally, at least the AAP is on board with, you know, lessons starting at uh, 12 months old. I'd prefer it said, you know, maybe younger. I know ISR can start at six months old, but a year old is, is great. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Better than being age five and we're yeah. well into, you know, their, their lives. It's amazing what happens between age one and four and yeah. how they're a sponge and how much they pick up when it comes to learning to swim. Right. So if you get the, the younger you can get, and I always started my kids when they were about like 15 months old, 18 mm -hmm. months old. So a little bit older, but I never wanted to go past the two-year-old mark where they hadn't okay. been. And it's yeah, mommy, baby, you know, in the, in the pool class, but you know, at least there's an instructor there. I, I would never be successful as a parent trying to teach my kid how to swim by myself right. or trying to do it through instructional videos. Yeah. I want somebody there physically that is going to teach me how to teach my child to do it, like hands on, you know. Yeah. And those, those survival swim instructors, what they do with, you know, babies is you know, young as six months old. It's, it's magic. It's really cool. You know, when you see a, an eight month old rolling over and floating on her own, it's, it's really special. And there's something to say that a lot of times where people have fear, it's where they waited too long, where they didn't get swim lessons and something right. happens where they have a near drowning and then they can't get past that at that age because they were older and they have a memory right. of that experience. And so if they can't get past that, they're never going to swim, right. you know, and that becomes a dangerous thing as they head into adulthood. And if they are on a boat or anything that they end up in water and they can't swim. So I agree with you, the younger that we can get, the better, because if something did happen, you don't really have a memory until you're like three years old. Uh, most people, most average people don't really remember anything when they're like one or two. You almost swear you weren't alive. Right. <laughs> you know, there's a rare person. I remember this when I was a year old, but that's not the average person, I don't think. So if it was like a near drowning during their swim lessons, they're not going to remember that. They're going to continue with swim lessons like it didn't really happen. And that's why hitting the younger age group like that is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hopefully we'll see improvements in the laws moving forward. That, that's my goal with the podcast is maybe somebody listens and it changes something for one person. Yeah, if you get one person you know, with it, right? If I can help one person through the podcast, through education from people like you that are experts, because I could talk all day on here, but having somebody like you and a lot of the other people that I've interviewed, it means so much more to the podcast and to the listeners. So, and, and I think education is important. You know, every, uh, every Thursday I do a, a podcast on child safety with, uh, with Rich Speck and he lost his son Reese to drowning uh, in 2012. And he's a teacher and, and he's always said that the drowning didn't kill his son. Ignorance did. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you combat ignorance with education. And so he thinks that if he can get enough people educated, then that's the, the cure for solving drowning. And, uh, and I believe that wholeheartedly. I, I do too. Totally agree with you. Yeah. Well, 
any final thoughts on pool fencing and layers of protection and drowning prevention? No, I think, you know, uh, if you're a, a parent with a pool, the more layers of protection, the better. If you're in the pool industry, I think um, the pool industry has come a long way from, you know, kind of not wanting to address pool safety to now, now the smarter pool companies, the smarter pool builders, the smaller, smarter pool service companies have adopted it into their, um, into their spiel, into their lingo. And they know that, you know, addressing these concerns is a much smarter approach than trying to ignore them. So I think that's great that pool builders now are kind of working pool safety into their uh, into their businesses. I think that's that's really a huge help. I think it's got to reduce drownings, and I think it's good for business too. I think it's easier to sell a pool if you can overcome those objections before they're brought up, uh, and if you can include you know a pool fence with it, you can maybe make some more money too. So I think these are all these are all good things. They're all pluses, and yeah. with so many pools going in the ground right now, this is really an important topic for everybody to just hear again. I know they've heard it before, but to hear it again, um, COVID really spurred something on here with people putting in backyard pools in. Yeah. I mean, they're going in like crazy, a new house, they're putting a pool in. Everybody wants a pool. They want their oasis steps from their house, but then we're forgetting about this great oasis you're putting in, but we're not thinking about the safety behind it. Yeah. And so with this bit, that's why I wanted to do this podcast series. Two reasons. Childhood drowning prevention is one of my big things outside of just what I do with Space Coast Pool School. And so it's it's actually really one of my big passions. And I'm like, oh, I can do this with the podcast. Yay. And really educate, which is one of my other things that I want to do. You know, so I'm educating ongoing through the podcast. So I really wanted to make sure that people understood how important this is. Well, yeah, absolutely. And it's great. You're doing it. It really is. And tell everybody where they can find lifesaver pool fence uh, on the internet so that they can go look you up. If a pool builder is listening and they want to sell a pool fence. Yeah. Our, our website is poolfence.com. real simple. So if you go to poolfence.com, you can find us and, uh, we're super active on Facebook and Instagram, um, you know, lifesaver pool fence on, on both those. So, you know, we put out a ton of water safety info. If you're a, a pool service company or a pool builder and you want to you know, share water safety info with your clients and with your followers, you know, we, we're already doing it for you. If you follow lifesaver and then share our stuff, you'll have that cornered or you'll have that taken care of. Um, same on Instagram. If you go to our Instagram and you reshare our stuff, um, you know, you'll have that taken care of. So, I've seen you know, something on Facebook too called Pool Fence DIY. Yeah, so we also Is that have you guys. That's, that's us. Yeah, it's you guys. Yeah, PoolFenceDIY.com and also Facebook, Instagram. That's where we sell pool fencing directly to homeowners. But we also sell that fencing to a lot of uh, pool guys who you know don't want to have a full you know pool fence installation business, but they want to do one occasionally. The Pool Fence DIY is a great way to do that. I've seen that on on Facebook and you put out a lot of really good info that um, on drowning prevention and, and yeah. the whole nine yards on there. So, well, thank you so much for being on my podcast today. I really appreciate it, Eric. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And you have a really great day. You too. Thanks for diving in today with the Let's Talk About Pools podcast. Be sure to follow us on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. And feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts so more aquatic professionals like you can learn about the show. We appreciate it, and we'll catch you in the next episode of the Let's Talk About Pools podcast.